very well. Thank you, Simon. Excellent. You You're dressed in SMP garb this evening, Steve, in support of the hate speech laws, presumably. Oh, I just tried to get my pen to match my uh, tie like oh, yeah. I normally do. Nicely done. Yeah. And wow. you've just come back from Scotland, right? I've just come back from Scotland, yes. I've been Bruce Devlin, um, yeah. but I've managed to... <laughs> Every time you hang out with that young man... <laughs> He's a good time girl. You come back looking a little warm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. Out. That was really good. Lovely comedy on each evening. Very nice. Excellent. Well, you're fighting the good fight. Let's take a look at the front pages. Uh, the Times kick us off with an outcry, it says, at uh, aid worker deaths. The Telegraph have PM demands answers after Israel airstrike kills Britons. The Guardian charities halt Gaza aid after drone attack kills seven staff. The Express, three Britons killed on Gaza mercy mission. The iNews, UK demands answers after Israeli strike kills seven aid workers. And finally, the Daily Star, who throw in the... the, uh, the, the, uh, the joker in the pack, fridges are snitches. Well, those were your front pages. So, kicking off the in-depth look into Wednesday's front pages with The Guardian, Steve. Yeah, I mean, most front pages have this, but they go with charities halt Gaza aid after drone attack mm -hmm. kills seven staff. Three Britons among the dead uh, are... Um... So, you, you've got the issue of who's to blame for this event, this event that shouldn't have happened, has happened. Israel have said they're going to look into it, they're going to... Um, they're going to look at their military ways of doing things to make sure it doesn't happen again, which is ex exactly what you should have. You should say this is an event that shouldn't happen. It is terrible. These are deaths that we should regret, and it needs to be looked into so it never happens again. Why did context take that step back? It's because there's a war going on, and terrible things happen in wars, and then you can ask the question about why do we still have a war. Either side could do stuff, but I tell you what, getting, releasing the hostages would be a step forward as well. So, all of this, there are layers of blame that you can... Certainly. Give, give it's about. fairly stark footage, though, isn't yeah. it? Uh, it does seem... It's hard for us to understand how, uh, of course, how wars are conducted nowadays. We've, all, of course, for centuries, the fog of war has confused things, but it seems less plausible of an, uh, an excuse when you can see for yourself on the screen exactly what somebody saw before the trigger was pulled, by the look of it. Well, uh, yeah, I don't. I, I still. I don't know. If, I don't know enough about how these things work. I don't know how. I, no. No, I just I feel really ignorant either. because but exactly. I mean, I'm saying the footage is extraordinarily stark. It's not. Mm. It's not like a, a hospital blowing up and the and a he said she said about who was in the basement. These yeah. do look like uh, assassinations, essentially. Um, it, I mean, it's been going on for some time now, and. Uh, there have been a lot, as you say, of controversial and disputed claims that uh, that they haven't been as cautious as they they claim to be the, the world's most reliably focused and targeted military. Do you think this is... Well, that's this, certainly you know... what The Guardian's trying to imply. I mean, the story beneath it is about snipers targeting children. Um, so yeah. that's, yeah, that's very much the tone of it. What about The Telegraph? Anything different there? Uh, well, they cover that as well, but they've also got this story, uh, row over whether homeless people could be arrested because they smell. Um, so this is uh, some proposed rough sleeping legislation. This hasn't happened yet. No. And there's a bit of a row over this. Um, the Tories are sort of saying, no, no, it's to make things better. It's about protecting the public um, uh, from nuisance, which could include damage to the environment, which could mean causing excessive noise, smells, litter or deposits of waste. And some people are saying, <laughs> what are you doing going back to the Victorian times, punishing people for being homeless, mm. but it hasn't happened yet. No. With the, we, we covered this, that there was a row in the Tory party about it last night, Steve. I don't know if it's moved on at all, but... Uh, there, I mean, I think there is uh, some room for understanding that there's been an escalation. I'm not saying anyone really believes it's a lifestyle choice, but on the other hand, like a lot of other things, like another story we have coming up later, yes. the, the, uh, if you ease regulations, if you ease off with policing, then it does seem to allow it to grow, right? Yeah. But the kind of issues normally around homelessness, you get into the definition of whether, whether we're talking street homelessness or just mm. a definition of homelessness, which means you have access to some benefits, but actually these are living on your friends' couches. Yeah. If you smell in public, I think we're talking street homelessness. I don't think anyone has ever become homeless because they think, well, I won't get fined for it. I don't think it, it's... The, and this is what we're looking at. They're trying to rejig the Vagrancy Act, which is a 200-year-old law. OK, yep. it needs tweaking, but the idea that you can find your way out of this... 
It's not because these people don't necessarily have money, and if no. they did have two thousand pounds and would find it, they might end up homeless. Wait a minute. I suppose the point is that they get moved on, and uh, if they're unable to pay the fine at a later date, well, at least they've been uprooted. Possibly. Well, and it gets them in the system, doesn't it? It's, yeah. it's getting yeah. you involved because at that but point. But we have noticed, have we not? Our high streets. I mean, Brighton has always been a, a, a little bit of a, you know, a. Uh... <laughs> A hub. <laughs> no, definitely. But you know, there are like quite a lot of uh, Paddington uh, Station fledged, um, every night. Like kind of camping uh, gear as it emerges onto yeah. the, you know, not yeah. a bloke in a bedroll, but uh, but like a, a three-man tent, such as you might leave at Glastonbury Festival if you couldn't be bothered to collapse it. These sort of things are making a difference as well. Yeah, I know, you're making a really good argument that, that the problem needs solving. I think mm. I'm saying is this necessarily? If you're going to arrest people for smelling everyone on the central line at times, it's going to end up in the nick. That's true. That would be good. I'd like on the spot uh, fines yes. for <laughs> too much strong aftershave on the tube. That would be my next move. Sorry. <laughs> what about the metro, Steve? What have they got? They have gone with uh, I'm a bid out of order. Uh -huh. This clumsy husband blows the thousand pounds battling against himself in an auction. The story's, I mean, that is embarrassing. Um, his wife, Debbie, tells the story. She watched in shock while he's uh, slightly younger than her husband, was sat there like an absolute fool, bidding against himself. Starts at £650 and he walks his way up in 50 quids all the way up to 1000 The audience were finding it hilarious, probably yeah. not worth that much money. The, the reason I start to have a lot of sympathy for him is it says, Debbie is a podcaster from Edinburgh. You poor man. Uh. Oh, everything <laughs> he does is going to be turned into an episode. So yes. He's done other things before where apparently he's... Uh, crashed their car and uh, he melted their fridge. These are the kind of things that could have been ignored, but you've married a podcaster. <laughs> oh, poor man. It does sound like it was a stunt, and possibly for they may be a, they may be like a pincer movement. This podcast couple, <laughs> I, I suspect, you know, that she has actually groomed him to become the, yes. the hapless buffoon. My I have been exactly. to a few charity auctions. It's not plausible that the auctioneer was not aware that the fellow... You know, you don't take a second bid for something. Yeah, there is absolutely. a mechanism to prevent that, unless he was wearing literally two hats and like running Tommy from, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> from one corner of the room to the other. <laughs> anyway, all in a good course. Finally, the Daily Star Crescent. Have they got a boffin? Fridges are snitches. No, but they haven't got a boffin, but I bet there were some boffins that went into this. They're talking about fridges. They've got some kind of camera equipment that spies on you. Ah. Uh, I mean, is this for people in shared accommodation, I guess? I don't know who stole the milk. Let's look at the footage. Probably Lewis, Lewis Schaefer. Or just trying to lose weight, maybe. I mean, it would be quite <laughs> useful to be able to say... Oh, oh, did you? Oh, really? Oh, so I wonder who did have it then? And then uh, be, <laughs> be able to run the footage. I would quite enjoy that. Yeah, but you never win a marital row with facts and evidence. The no, worst, that's true. The last thing you could do is Google for the right answer, because yes. that's going to come back and bite you. <laughs> but would it not be... It might be... You might not need necessarily a full-blown camera. Maybe you just need a tiny cardboard cutout of a police officer standing on the top <laughs> shelf, like they have in petrol <laughs> stations, just well, to make is... you feel you're being watched. You, you could know? do... This is... The more techn technological version of, of sticking Kate Moss on the fridge, isn't it? Yes. It's like someone's watching <laughs> you. We all I do that, right? When I was young <laughs> and um, I had a friend, I can't remember his name, Christopher something, anyway, his parents, they were quite sort of, they were sort of slightly hippie, cool, you know, modern parents. They had a picture, a postcard, of an extraordinary, like, grotesquely overweight woman naked on the front of the fridge. <laughs> and that, it turned out, was to try and uh, incentivise well, you to resist. Well, they're doing it. There's but talk I of... misunderstood it completely. I, I thought it was like a, come on! <laughs> <laughs> is your friend thin or is he just into really large women? I haven't women seen him then? for a very long time, but it'd be interesting to follow him up, yeah. Check I think, out his I think they profile. were ascetic. <laughs> He's a feeder now, isn't he? I wonder if he's sitting at home watching going, I knew that would come up sooner or later. <laughs> well, those were your front pages. Coming up in the second half, we have... Uh, goodness, I, I think we have uh, all the latest from J.K. Rowling's uh, realm. We have difficult conversations becoming impossible, says woman in, uh, in soundproof booth. And many more stories beside. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, 
um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, yeah, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something that, that while he while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed mm. and, you know, yes. th but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody. just the mums Everybody's that get their hands on the babies. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Aha. Welcome back to Headliners with me, Simon Evans. I'm still with comedian Stephen Allen and Cressida Wetton. We're going to have a look inside the papers now. And we kick off, Steve, with good, if unsurprising, news in the Metro. Free speech staggers on, but polite fiction, I fear, is dead. So J.K. Rowling won't face police action despite inviting arrest over Scotland's new hate crime law. I don't know if it's even been mentioned on this uh, show. But Scotland has <laughs> a new hate uh, law. That hate sort of law. triviality doesn't concern us, you know. <laughs> fridges that uh, record when you've eaten food. That's yes. what we're about. So The it... fridge starts to use uh, sizes slurs. <laughs> yeah, then they'll send Scotland round. So it says, Scotland's hate... It's what in the article. Scotland's hate crime and public order bracket Scotland Act 2021. Mm -hmm. Update the year. Um, it's just come into effect, isn't it? But... Mm. Um, um, you could get seven years if you, here's the quote, communicate material or behave in a manner that a reasonable person would consider to be threatening or abusive, especially if you include their uh, protected characteristic, uh, characteristics. And that comes back later. Mm. So she posted some April Fool's jokes, which were actually... Well, they weren't jokes, was it? It was, uh, it was making a point. F and she won't face arrest for this. Mm. Firstly, I would feel sorry for anyone sent around to arrest her. <laughs> if you can't afford a lawyer, yeah. do you know what I mean? Um, but then the police said they'll take no further action. I hope it's because of the, the ray of light in this, because a reasonable person test might be kicking in. If if you can rely on the legal system to run that test. Yeah. So it's not just you've said a word that people are offended by. It needs to be obvious that you were trying to cause harassment and you were including some of these words. I'm I think, not, I think sure realistically, she's obviously she's, she's trying to uh, use uh, a high-profile... Uh, provocation to to test and destroy the the law to prove that yeah. it can't be employed. Yeah, and doing a very good job. And of it. she's done a great job to bring sort of ridicule down upon the the whole thing. But it probably isn't actually a useful test, is it? I don't think it's demonstrated that you can, for instance, simply assert that trans women are men and uh, and and no no further action will be taken because her doing it in such a high profile way mm. they were obviously trying to avoid 
some confrontation on that scale, and I suspect it will still, sooner or later, catch somebody. Right. Well, I would I would direct people to check out the hate monster from last night in Edinburgh, mm. which is uh, on my Twitter and <laughs> on Comedy Unleashed's Twitter. The, the hate monster was there, and he'll or she. I'm not sure what is it a he or she. I don't know. Uh, the they will give you a rundown about this. Um, anyway, Rishi says it's not going to happen here, so that's great, isn't it? Because he's in charge for the next ten minutes. Yeah. So, um... <laughs> Well, this is what, and we mentioned it, as Steve hinted last night, and I'm sure I have done on many occasions, but the reality is that the Labour MPs in uh, the Scottish Parliament were as very nearly as keen. They certainly voted for this legislation, right. so there's no reason to suppose that these tweaks won't be uh, brought before the Parliament. Do you know, I think the best way to test the system to the point of failure is not high-profile people saying things. Mm. It's more about if you... Uh, if there is a complaint, they've promised to investigate all complaints... Yeah. Now, that, if you've got infinite police, fair enough, but they don't. So if people were just making complaints about things that weren't in any way likely to be caught by this act, they keep the police so busy that eventually realise you can't have this yeah. system in effect. I think they've got something like 20,000 complaints being made yeah. in the first 24 hours, but they will probably just, like, sweep those away and just... Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah but with your reasonable... Harvest. Staying with the hate crimes in the Telegraph, Cressida, this is a discrepancy between burglary clear-up rates and online squabble investigations. I think has been identified. That's right. Uh, police recording petty rows as hate crimes, despite pleas from ministers. So uh, we know that last year they were the Home Office said, "Look, stop it. We're not having any more of this nonsense." Mm. Uh, Non-crime hate incidences are uh, well, they don't meet the criminal threshold, so, but sometimes they're being recorded anyway, and then uh, they can they're recorded against somebody. So. We were talking the other day, you were saying it might be the case if you're volunteering at a school or something like that. Those are the sort of... Yeah, yeah, uh, your CBD check. Right, because yeah. you might think, well, what does it really matter? But it does mm, matter because it goes against your name and, and so on. So um, the police are still doing this. They've been told not to. Uh, and, of course, this is, well, trad crime uh, is, is not being investigated um, there's just these horrendous... Trad crime, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's... yeah a bit like trad wives. <laughs> I think so, yeah. yeah. It's, it's your good old-fashioned crime, you know, the real crime ones, burglary. Exactly, yes. exactly. <laughs> um, and it's not, you know, that stuff's not... But there is being... a lot of this. I mean, somebody was sharing on Twitter earlier the little film of somebody uh, using... And maybe I shouldn't even mention that this is a possibility now, but a battery-powered axle grinder, I think they're called, to basically go through a bike lock in about 30 seconds and make off with a bike. Mm. Right. And this would be a terrible thing if this becomes a, uh, a widespread phenomenon in, in London because you just know the police will have no interest at all in trying to track down that kind of thing. Apart from anything else, that, that axle grinder could be turned on a, on a human face. The, the people who use it might easily be carrying a knife, whereas somebody who sent a mean tweet is a fairly easy sort of form to be filled in, isn't it? Well, you say that until they tweet a nasty thing about you yeah. for, for all the <laughs> arresting that you've done. Um, uh, I think, well, the police should be following the instruction of the, the Home Secretary because it's not like I've loved all the recent Home Secretaries, but at least I know who to vote out if I disagree. Mm. If you have a system where the Home Secretary says one thing the police does another, you're very much powerless to have any control over it as a, as a citizen. Um, I mean, this was set up up following St the Stephen Lawrence case, this is what I talk about so often, the unintended consequences of a badly phrased law. Yes. And this is what you've got, something that was meant to provide a purpose, but now people are just adding to a record of this person might be a bit racist in the future or might be transphobic in the future. What do you think the purpose was in, in connection with Stephen Lawrence that before it even got to the point where they attacked and murdered him, they, yeah. would, uh, they would have been arrested for... or there would have been an intervention from the police because they... Yeah. Probably not arrested because of what mm. we're talking about. Something it's that a doesn't non crime, hit, uh, yeah. Yeah, non crime. Um, and the other thing I was going to say is isn't a CBD test whether you're high on that oil or not? <laughs> yes, it might be. Yeah. Yes, I might have got my CBT, but that's uh, whether you can ride a moped, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> It's just too many tests, I'm past it. Staying with the Telegraph, Steve, today's April showers, no excuse for this shower, according to Lord Crudus. Tory grassroots group launches campaign to oust wet MPs. Um, they've launched this campaign to move the party to the right. Conservative Post, which is a website linked to Lord Crudus, a Tony... A Tory donor who's given £3 million, which is £2 million less than the threshold to get away with being racist. It's good to know <laughs> that, isn't it? And uh, there's a system where Tory party members could end up working on deselecting people they consider too much of a centrist. Yeah. That's up to you if the system's in place. Knock yourself out, fill your boots. It will turn the party more into the thing you like you will be less likely to win. When you've got a system, first past the post, that then settles down to a two-party system, you've got to convince the centre ground. If you have an offering that the centre ground can't stomach, 
the other team will get it. So but there's, there's some truth to that. But, Cressida, we have noticed, of course, reform are now polling in double digits. Oh, well, um, yeah, I and thought... And that's exactly why, right? Because people yes. don't feel that they can trust the Conservatives with a, an actual right-wing vote. Exactly. Yeah, Lord Crudders, we've already got a system. It's called Go to Reform. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's exactly <laughs> what... But the improvement of the reform polling numbers is from Tory... People who would have voted Tory who did in 2019. Yeah. This idea of the silent majority that's hiding there should have been there in 2019. If you add together the Brexit Party and Tory votes, they were 47% of people who voted. Yeah. And all you're doing is taking from the pile, losing some of that centre ground that will go off to Labour and converting some of the Tory voters to reform voters so that still that number added together is less likely to beat the other side. Well, I suppose there's some truth to that, but I suppose the calculation is you lose some wets and so you lose some people who might have voted for those wets, but on the other hand, the reform people come back in. And so you strengthen the party on the other side and you make it a party which is actually dedicated to the yeah. political agenda that you as the donor can, you know, regard as, as, the, uh, as the one which, which will set the company right. And what I'm trying to say is even if you win all of those back, the numbers still wouldn't work out for you because you've no. lost too much of the, the disputed ones that go to Labour in the middle. Yeah. Well, it's not going to work this time around anyway, isn't it? It all seems very hypothetical. The Times now, Cressida, and uh, difficult conversations becoming impossible, says this woman. Yeah, exactly. The proof box. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Difficult conversations becoming impossible in the UK, says Ofsted chief. Um, so, yeah, Amanda Spielman insists that the watchdog must be able to give tough messages to schools because she's making the case that, uh, you know, Ofsted off, uh, is there for the kids, not for the teachers. But yeah. there's this culture of sort of wanting to be nice. Um, and obviously we had uh, the lady who killed herself after a, a damning Ofsted report, um, which is sort of had a lot of press attention at the time. And, yeah. and this woman was sort of saying, look, that's just not what it's for. Uh, and she talks about the people who work for Ofsted, typically sort of modest, conscientious people. They're not... Um, they want Duncan Bannatyne in there, you know, to go and yeah. to deliver tough messages. So, yeah, lack of discipline. It's a very sort of feminisation of society sort of story, isn't it? You, it makes me think of Catherine Burble's thing, you know, the, the woman yes. who's the strict Although it's teacher. interesting, it's the woman... I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that feminisation or the therapeutic culture, certainly, like, making everyone's feelings uh, mm. uh, a high priority, but also it's coming from a woman, so I suppose there's a limit to what you can say is, like, the feminisation. Well, you have but, to say, on average, yes, she's yeah. not... Your but typical. there is... Well, I mean, no, but that's the thing, isn't it? Women have often been the first... You know, I mean, Thatcher was, was probably, the you know, the most stern critic yeah. of that kind of approach. There are some there are some messages that are unpopular that are that are going to uh, they're going to hurt and if it's not hurting it's not working. Ofsted, I don't know enough about it to be absolutely clear, but they do seem to have, have developed a reputation for being extraordinarily undiplomatic in certain circumstances. But I think it would be horribly cruel. Actually, uh, perhaps this is an ironic observation, but I think it'd be horribly cruel to blame the Ofsted inspectors for this poor woman's suicide. Nobody commits suicide just because they've had a bad, you know... Well, I like agree, it, what but... amounts to a bad assessment at work, right? Yes, yeah. but they, the way they phrase it is that... Uh, I don't know how they phrase it. It's something like it, they, they believe it played a, a yeah. factor. Yeah, because the school went from outstanding to inadequate or something, didn't it, in a single swoop, which, you yeah. know, I mean, that would be a terrible yeah. blow. But... but then you don't blame the inspectors. I think you're no. right not to blame the inspectors. The system. And at the time when that news story was, was fresh, we I remember we debated it loads, and it is about the, how the system doesn't work. You have to take all of the nuance of all of the world of education and boil it down to five different outcomes, which means it's as inaccurate as the food hygiene rating and kebab shops, whereas... So, having a reason to reform it and have a little bit of yeah. ability to say where you need improvement, but you do need to be able to fail someone without the risk of them killing themselves, which then yes. means you can't use the bottom two of the of the five, so then you've boiled well, it down to Well, you probably need brains. to say, perhaps... I think five... five uh, God knows, it's arbitrary, but maybe five is fine, but perhaps... I am absolutely spitballing it, but perhaps it would be helpful to say you can't slide people more than two grades in a single report and mm. say, like, OK, this is, uh, this is a significant downturn and so we're going to come back in short... I think you need... I understand what you're saying about nuance, but I think you do need to be able to give a clear guide to parents as to whether or not their local school is, is, is uh, in significant trouble. Well, and people but... talk anyway, don't they? I think people... I, I'm always sort of surprised that we even need this, cos don't parents just get together on mum's net and everybody knows which is the good school, everybody knows where they want to yeah. get their kids in? Yeah, I, I expect you're right. International news now, Steve. Uh, the iNews is warning of what I fear is not a new single-person shooter game. Yes, the world must prepare for ISIS 2.0. This is according to uh, Iraq former minister. 
um, who was foreign minister when ISIS seized parts of Iraq in 2014, says that there's a viable environment for the terror group to return. Oh, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting article, but if you read through it, you could say, yes, they could. It's effectively saying they could come back because they. Uh, existed in the first place. Yeah. The same things are there. But then it also says that this time their goal wouldn't be to establish an Islamic state. So oh. rebrand, at the very least. If you what called, would their goal be this time? Just to cause a bit of mayhem? To call, control some areas. OK. Is what it says. But I did think that if you call the Islamic state, you're not trying to form an is Islamic state. A caliphate. Yeah, a caliphate or, yeah. or bus. Yeah. Do you remember the, the time when we went through calling them IS? ISIS and then Daesh because they didn't like it. Oh, that'll show them. Or ISIL <laughs> as well, wasn't it? I can't remember ISIL they were at one point. Yeah, ISIS was the Islamic State in Syria, wasn't it? Is that right? I yeah. think that was. I can't remember the. I'd, the I'd love the idea that we politically went through this. Let's call them yes. Daesh because they yeah. think it's a pejorative. Well, that'll show them. <laughs> um, but he said we need to be ready for ISIS 2.0 or ISIS B. I've come up with other subtitles for it. Uh, ISIS 2 Islamic Boogaloo <laughs> uh, and ISIS too furious, too fast. Nice. During Ramadan. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh, too fast yeah. during Ramadan. Very good. Cool. <laughs> I like that. Well, that's it for part two, folks. Coming up, we have Marie Black at the Fringe. Slavery souvenirs put beyond value, and it turns out making fentanyl legal makes it more popular. We will be exploring all those topics in a couple of minutes. See you there. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Yes, there will be some drier, brighter weather around across southern parts tomorrow. But first, there's quite a bit of rain to come, driven by an area of low pressure and an associated frontal system that's sweeping up from the southwest, bringing outbreaks of rain for many. Though initially tonight, there will be some dry weather across parts of Northern Ireland and Northern England, though the outbreaks of rain arriving here. And across the eastern parts of Scotland, some persistent rain could actually bring some hills snow over the highest ground. Across the far northwest of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost first thing tomorrow morning. Otherwise, Wednesday gets off to a mild, cloudy and rather damp start for many. Outbreaks of rain, which could turn heavy and persistent across parts of Northern Ireland and southern Scotland through the morning, they will continue across many northern areas into the afternoon, though breaking up a little bit. Across more central and southern parts of England and Wales, turning drier, a few showers, but also some decent bright sunny spells in which it should feel relatively warm with highs around 16 Celsius, but markedly colder than this further north. More unsettled weather to come as we go through Thursday. Watch out for some heavy outbreaks of rain sweeping their way from west to east across southern parts of England with further outbreaks of rain further north too, and more persistent rain pushing in from the southwest later on. And the unsettled theme continues as we head towards the weekend. Could turn very windy, in fact, by Saturday, but temperatures rising likely to get to 20 Celsius. Bye-bye. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. And welcome back to Headliners. So, good news on the Edinburgh Fringe from the Times Cressida. One less show for stand-up comedians to compete with. 
Well, I'm not, I think I'm not sure, actually. Uh, Myri Black promises brutally honest Edinburgh Fringe show. So this is the SNP uh, Deputy Westminster leader who's on her way out. She said last year she's had enough. It's too toxic. She can't work in Westminster. She's going to go and work with nice, civilised stand-up comics. What? Yeah. <laughs> um, so she's... No, but she, she is... I think this is going to be a comedy show, cos I really? first thought, oh, it's going to be like an evening with, you know, just yeah. stories and ha-ha-ha ta talking Anecdotes. about... Anecdotes. Yeah, exactly. All the terrible, drunken debauchery of Westminster. But she actually does refer to her own sense of humour in this, so it sort of sounds like she's... I think she she's doing... She a sense of humour. I remember once in the House of Commons, she, uh, she was regarded Boris Johnson's government as fascist. The, she, I said, I'm, I'm going to use the F word, fascism. It's there, and we're too afraid to, to, to say it. I thought that was a great routine. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that Boris Johnson could approach the organisational capabilities necessary <laughs> to, to well, just let the trains. Yeah. Yeah. There you go, levels of irony. Maybe it'll be brilliant. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, that, this is coming to Edinburgh this year. I, I'm uh, eager to see whether she gets reported for hate speech and well, on a regular <laughs> basis. She does describe her own sense of humour as fairly dark. Yeah. So, pretty much, let's yeah. get the complaints in already. Uh, she also said that after a third of her life she was an MP, she's Kind of do if you're a third of your life you've been an MP, you are the establishment you're railing against. Well, on the other hand, it's it's a function of her ridiculously young age. She entered the house at the age of 12 or something, didn't she? And, yeah, uh, she, was still a yeah. she was still an undergraduate. She yeah. spent a third of her life as an MP and a third of her life asleep, as we all do. So <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it must be mainly scrolling. Uh, <laughs> speaking of workshy 20-something, Steve, Telegraph have evidence of a trend. Yet yeah, hiring Gen Z, I refuse to say Z, Good is a nightmare. Uh, they don't turn up for their first day at work. I still say article. Gen Christ as well instead of Gen X, but that's more <laughs> controversial. <laughs> <laughs> or like King's Cross. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so a nightmare is how this James McNeil has described his experience of working with Generation Zs. Quick little context. <laughs> this, um, this grouping of generations is fairly borderline horoscopes. So I'm born in 1977. This is what bothers me about it. Born okay. in 1977, I'm Jen Christ. OK. Uh, which, are you telling me I've got more in, in common with someone born in 1965 than I have someone three years younger That's than me? That's me. I'm 1965. Yeah. I'm, Je I'm the first year of the Gen X. Yeah, we've got nothing in common. <laughs> we got you and I, <laughs> we see face to we see eye to eye on most matters. Terrible. Don't, don't disprove me this Other early in the story. Other than shed usage. I think... <laughs> but, I, no, I know what you mean. I think there are useful... I don't think the thing about generations is necessarily you can say they come in 25-year blocks. I think certain things happen at certain crucial stages. You know, there's this book, The Fourth Turning, and they, they've revived it again recently. You know about this? This, no. this takes, like, the generations... Um, the greatest generation of the ones who fought in the war, then the boomers. And I think the boomers is a thing because they actually did... They, they were a, a cohort who experienced, you know, a massive upsurge yeah. in economic confidence. But it's an American phenomenon, right? To use baby boomers in, in the UK, anyone born in the first ten years after the war in this country, their parents were living through rationing and were, you know, coming to terms with the fact that Britain had lost pretty much everything that the previous 100 years had taken for granted. Two very different cohorts in that respect. Yeah. Just because you're born at a certain time doesn't mean that you're born into a certain set of conditions. Yeah, it just means that you live through certain things. But just the actual story says that they don't, he employed two of them, they didn't even turn up on their yeah. first day. I mean, the Generation Z thing does mean we get to insult young people, so sleeves up. Forget that I yeah, complained. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we've been told to get a work-life balance and they've kind of taken it so far because they've devalued what work is in their life and maybe it's because they don't particularly think it's going to pay off for them. Maybe mm. they've... You know, if you spend your entire childhood paying attention to your emotional health, maybe you work less. Here's the kicker, though. While um, unemployment's where it is and when everyone else retires, they will end up with the jobs, working from home, whether you like it or not. Yeah. If you need to fill a role, you're going to have to meet... Not if they don't turn up at all. I think you, th that's got to be... You've got to occasionally go to work. They do turn up, they have a mental health day because they couldn't they buy say, ramen I think they day. say they don't turn up for interviews. This is what the, the complaints are. I think so there's the, somebody that got a job. Yeah. Uh, right. It wasn't it's a high-end role, but it paid £35,000 a year, company car, laptop, phone, decent position. Uh, on both occasions, on the first day, they just didn't show up. I mean, the confidence wow. of it, or the lack of... I suppose it's yeah. the low testosterone, all that. 
that stuff we're always hearing, you know, that... Mm. Um... But ultimately, there'll be no-one else to fill those jobs. So you're yeah. right. I mean, you need people to turn up. But well, there might be uh, embodied AI in robots, yeah, possibly. Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> How lovely. <laughs> Solved it. There we go. Fingers crossed. Now, Chris, we're on to one of the hardest things to value this evening, but value it we must. A story in The Times about a segment in Antiques Roadshow. Yes, Antiques Roadshow expert refuses to value slavery disc. So uh, this lady's brought in an old... Uh, it's a disc that's got an inscription on it. It turns out this was uh, owned by a Nigerian slave trader. Uh, and this guy, Ronnie Archer Morgan, who's the presenter, the, the antiques expert, he said he's just not prepared to put a price on this mm. because it's disgusting and he doesn't want to... He doesn't want to value it. very upset. I saw, watch the clip. It, yeah. Watch it on the, the uh, newspaper's website, whatever. He's explaining that his own... I think his great-aunt or something had been a returned slave from Canada to Sierra Leone. I couldn't quite understand what the... But he had some family connection with slavery anyway, mm. of a negative kind, and it was all quite emotional. But um, I can't help thinking it... They must encounter quite a few objects over the course of the last 30 years or so of, of Antiques Roadshow which have some kind of connection with dark practices of one kind or another. Highly likely. You know, uh, yeah. murder weapons, very probably, or, uh, I, I don't know... Th Classic novels. ..belonging to people who had made their money in that field, anyway. Yeah. It's not as if even, like, your Wedgwood... Your Josiah Wedgwood Potteries, probably, working conditions were not significantly different from that of slavery <laughs> for a lot of the, the poorest there. I don't know. What do you think? It does feel a little bit precious. Well, it's provoked a conversation, hasn't yes. it? Which is... Yeah. I'm always saying, you know, put a plaque on it, talk about what it is, rather than hide it away. Good what that they would have been more it. interesting, and what he didn't seem able to do, was to identify exactly what it was. It was connected with slavery, and it was mm. engraved on ivory, and he, dem and he sort of emphasised that, they, that you, they, you know, Antiques Roadshow find that abhorrent as well. Well, of course, you know. <laughs> but Antiques Roadshow, there's something to find abhorrent in it, virtually everything you handle, isn't there? Yeah. You know, whether it be it's, teak from a... Good from a know. you know... <laughs> I'm making a long list of which TV shows don't like slavery, and it's good to know Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> Still waiting to find out about Songs of Praise, but yes. I'm hoping, fingers crossed... We Blue Peter, I seem to remember, was always a bit, like, 50-50. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth remembering it's a TV show. It's not as if yeah. you actually took it to be valued and they refused. You took it on a TV show and they made a deal out of it. The woman uh, paid three quid for it uh, at some kind of market stall or something. It's not as if it had been passed down to her through her uh, ancestors. Who no, they made that very it, clear. You know, from, the, <laughs> from his cold, dead hands. Anyway, <laughs> over to everyone's favourite Mad Libs in Portland, Oregon. But according to the Mail, they are going into reverse. Yep, uh, Oregon Democrat governor signs law making drug possession crime again after Liberal laws fled to, uh, led to uh, the floods of street use. So... This is because, pr previously, um, they decided to decriminalise yeah. some drugs. You think, OK, let's find out which drugs. That's very key here, isn't it? We're just talking about some of them, you know, this Shaggy from scooby Doo. He's yeah, yeah. some sort of a ganj This user. isn't grass, Shaggy. Um, <laughs> no, this is... Uh, let's have a look. Where's the list of ones? It's uh, fentanyl's definitely in there, heroin yeah. and methamphetamine. Yeah. Turns out they've put them on the same par as having a parking ticket. Yes. And... I tell you what else is uh, on the par of having a parking ticket: bad parking, and that's not stopped, has it? People no. park badly everywhere, so <laughs> clearly a parking ticket wasn't going to stop you doing these incredibly addictive drugs. So it's bad news for the libertarian types. They've had to say, uh, actually, no, you do need to ban some drugs, otherwise people are off their face on them. Now, the change comes into effect on September the first. You can get six months in jail. What I love about this is it's really interesting to use America as a little petri dish experiment for our drug laws. Yes. Let's just hold off for a while and see what happens over see there. See what happens. Although yeah. we covered it last night, Germany has basically uh, decriminalised cannabis. Um, but cannabis, you would say, is a lot milder and uh, will probably lead to less people, you know, just literally their lives falling apart. Yeah. Um, but... I don't know. It's um, it's interesting that these things are sort of swimming in the opposite direction. Portland, Oregon has been, as you say, for a couple of decades now, regarded as the as sort of ground zero for the mm. most of the lunatic, woke <laughs> left kind of project. So I don't think, think that's how they phrase. <laughs> <laughs> well, they made their own sketch show about it. Are they called Porties or something? Or uh, you know, uh, put that, uh, yeah, know. there was there was a whole kind. There was a TV show made in America. Right, right about how, just how... I, I guess you might, to put it more kindly, say, bien pensant, you know, they just... is. I think that's the right term. Good they thinking. think the best of everyone, you know. They right. assume that everyone is well-intentioned and if you just stop castigating and stigmatising certain behaviours, then everything will just find its own way.
Right. Well, it's, yes, as Steve said, it's interesting, isn't it? Watch them over there and then have a think about what we're going to do here. On my to-read list, I'd like to read Peter Hitchens' book about... I think it's called The War We Never Fought. Mm. And Because uh, I, I... I don't know what the answer is, but um, I'm sure he's got some strong opinions. And this is... This is showing us what happens, isn't yeah, it? It's, yeah. some, it's a pretty good study, I You're would right. Say. This is the, the argument Hitchens had with Russell Brand on a regular basis uh, about, about the mm. idea that simply, as, you know, as the, the people who are pro it say, if you de decriminalise it, legalise it, then it makes it much easier to deal with as, as in an appropriate way, like with clinical uh, mm. uh, yeah. interventions. And actually, no, it doesn't. It uh, it just means that everyone just, like, lets themselves go. It can be a whiff of both, though, can't it? I think if you are chemically addicted to something, that is a health problem. You will yeah. need some health help. Yeah. But the thing you're addicted to is incredibly addictive. You yeah. couldn't get it in the first place. Better to decriminalise decrim yeah. that firstly. Anyway, now, Guardian, now, Cressida, I'm going to give you my full beam as you talk us through this one. Nice. UK government launches review into headlight glare after driver's complaint. So, apparently, this is a massive problem. Uh, mm. People are getting more upset about being dazzled by headlights. Um, and it, it says here, uh, the fact that... So, the government... Are, they're looking into taking some action. Uh, the fact the government has listened to drivers' concerns and heeded our calls to examine the complex issue of headlight glare. Is it complex? I mean, apparently, they're just using LEDs now, so headlights are a bit too bright. I haven't noticed. Have you, Steve? Oh, I can't believe you got the story and you're not on my side. This is <laughs> middle-aged men complaining about things to do with driving. <laughs> yes, they are a lot brighter. Are Maybe they? I'm older and my, uh, my eyes aren't as good as they yeah, used to right. be. But, no, I'm sure it's this. I think it's... And they mention it in here, but it's more to do with the height of the vehicles. Oh, OK. So SUVs just mean that the light's coming towards you. I, I drive a car that's very low to the ground. Yes, Which makes course. it sound sportier than a Toyota Igo yeah. really is. Um, <laughs> but it just means you're getting the full glare right in the eyes. Yeah. That's a massive problem. Can Trump's you not adjust the prism of your windscreen? Yes, I'll go off and change his refractive index. But then I'll just be getting blue in there and the red <laughs> shooting at the top. That's the problem. Well, that's interesting. I'll be driving home in what I think is fairly foul weather uh, in about half an hour. Yeah. I will um, pay close attention <laughs> to that. That will liven things up. At the end of part three, we have just one more part to go. Disappointing scones, screaming babies and a woman marrying herself, possibly to avoid the screaming babies. We'll see you in a couple of minutes. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can do amazing things for this country and for the world, and I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the Church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, but they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. Well, why not spend a hundred million or a billion pounds on a new generation of almshouses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex. Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe... A I mean, well, well, look, if we look over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for, because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mar system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and as Albie actually pointed out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one billion is not enough. 100, it's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, it, church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's woke nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue signaler, well, is it not? Should charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's it, it very Christian of them. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel.
Britain's News Channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. And welcome back to Headliners. So the Independent Steve, a row at the National Trust over woke scones or possibly wok scones. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So the National Trust defends scone recipe after secretly making it vegan. As you said, they are a very contentious food. Scone, scone, jam mm. first, cream first. Mm. The number of wars that have been fought over this, actually more than religion. Um, but some visitors complain that these new ones, they're like uh, dry biscuits now that they're yeah, vegan. that's a new controversy entirely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, yeah, do you put VAT on it if it tastes like a dry biscuit? Yeah. Um, but I, I, I suppose if they hadn't been impacted in terms of their texture, you couldn't really complain. No one should have a moral argument like, I will only eat this if I know a cow's yeah. teats have been fiddled with yeah. but if it has been impacted then fair enough but wait a minute the charity says they've been making them without butter for years yes. plot twist and also they've their 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 recipes are freely available so yeah. you can inspect them which yeah. presumably somebody has done could you just say a bit it, yeah, i can tell you who that someone is yeah. 64 year old maud said that uh, i can't stand the taste of the new ones you're older, Maud. Maybe you were taste buds. Coming to well, and they serve them with cream, so they're not really trying to be vegan, are they? This is just That's giving you point. the what, option. What kind of cream they serve them with? Cow cream. Vegan margarine. The original. Well, it's, so it sure says it's here. Some sort it of says margarine. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> but it says that butter and cream are readily available. Isn't this just the wider thing of everyone's getting a bit annoyed that the NHS, uh, the NHS, the yeah. National Trust is getting woker? Well, that's the perception. The National Trust has done some annoying woke things. But this, I don't think being vegan scones is necessarily <laughs> a, 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 a facet of that controversy. Yeah. But I do think their cafeterias are ridiculously expensive and their food is not that great. And actually, I used to go to the National Trust quite a lot when I was a little bit... When I was on tour and stuff, I'd quite often fill in... Uh, you know, a day with nothing to do, go and see a nice garden, enjoy them, even yeah. wander around the house. The, the cafeterias are pricey and they have a captive audience and I think they should deliver what they want, these people. How many years ago is this? Because you might have accidentally had a woke vegan <laughs> scone. <laughs> no. Oh, spit it out now, even. It's not too late. Don't you think it's just cost, <laughs> cost saving as well? I mean, butter is expensive, isn't it, compared to whipped up? Whatever you said, yeah, Marjorie. Yeah, we have to get it from New Zealand now because of the uh, because of Liz Truss or something. <laughs> I get confused. <laughs> Daily Mail now, Cressida. Here's a name I haven't heard in some time. The most controversial guru in the nursery, Gina Ford, is back. Could babies sleep guru Gina Ford, whose controversial 90s book urged parents to let newborns cry it out and made her a fortune, be making a comeback with millennials? Uh, yeah, so apparently... Not Gen Z, though. They don't get a mention. <laughs> they don't get a mention Every generation's got a mention. <laughs> <laughs> we had boomers and their scones, yeah. and now well, we've got millennials and their screaming uh, kids. I'm a millennial, I haven't got any kids, you both have. I'm probably not the right person to be... Oh, it was hugely controversial. Our, well, ours were born in 2004 and 2007 and Gina Ford was... Well, she sounds horrific. You're yeah. not allowed to look at your look your baby in the eye after 10 p.m. That's What's right. that all about? <laughs> or your you husband. mustn't have it in, <laughs> in the bed. You have to get the baby up by 7 a.m. It can't sleep in. There's yeah. all these mad rules. It doesn't sound good. I do believe in attachment theory, and this sounds like a recipe for a lot of problems later What's on. What's attachment theory? Uh, it's, you can glue it's... them to the ceiling. Rub it in your hair. It's the theory. It's about how people. There's three broadly th three categories of how people tend to deal with intimacy. Okay. And there's a lot of research that says it starts in childhood. Anyway, um, this sounds like it could cause a lot of people a lot of trouble, but some people oh. apparently think it's brilliant. Yeah. Could it just be that some babies are more trouble than others by nature? I think you're right. I mean, I, my theory about childbearing at this point, and everyone did used to exchange theories all the time mm. about how to stop them crying, and some people's kids obviously were just better than others. Right. And the other thing is, the advice you give is whatever it happened to be that you were doing at the point mm. at which the kid just grew out of it. You know, whatever it was, and that carried on being the case. My dad had a seat with a massive spring that they used to put in the doorway. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And just bow, and apparently it used to make me fall asleep. But that Get a big spring. That's just to amuse you. <laughs> so you don't really have anxious attachment, but you can only have intimate relations in a door frame. <laughs> Buy on, buy on, ready, darling, <laughs> <one. laughs> <laughs> Staying with the borderline nut jobs, Cressida, uh, the woman who married herself defies the trolls. <laughs> so sad. I paid £3,000 to marry myself. Vile trolls who say no one would love me are wrong. <laughs> I mean, the confidence of it. Uh, body positivity, what a surprise, influencer Danny Evans married herself in a lavish, lavish ceremony. In a lav. Where she... <laughs> <laughs> well, nearly, she faced a mirror <laughs> a more and vowed to give herself grace and value herself. I mean, it's just... I hate this. When self-love is really just about having long bars and eating chocolate, it's just... I hate it. Yeah. This is so sad. It's another facet... I've used that word twice now in this section, but it's another aspect of the infertility cult, isn't it, that's overwhelming? Yes. Well, yeah. The world a little bit. Do you I want was... to slip in your last story about Lulu? You've got 20 seconds. Um, yeah, <laughs> the uh, the mirror says Lulu reveals one thing she refuses to do before 12pm. Is and it if you... marry herself? It's... <laughs> <laughs> She's it, not giving up hope until lunchtime. Uh, and if you read the article, it's it's in paragraph five where they say, speak. Speak. So there you go, saved you reading all that rubbish. And, and... she's saving her voice for concerts, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not surprising, is it? Uh, she still, she, she shagged David Bowie, so, you know, she must be doing something right. Uh, we have uh, come <laughs> to the end of the show, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's very nearly over anyway. Let's take another quick look at Wednesday's front pages. We have The Times, outcry at aid workers' deaths. The Telegraph, PM demands answers after Israel airstrike kills Britons. Guardian, charities halt Gaza aid after drone attack kills seven staff. The Express, three Britons killed on Gaza mercy mission. The I News, UK demands answers after Israeli strike kills seven aid workers. And finally, The Daily Star, fridges are snitches. Those were your front pages, and it's all we have time for. Thank you to my guests. We're back tomorrow at 11pm. Somebody else is hosting some other guests. It'll all be much the same format. You've been a wonderful audience. If you've been watching at 5am, stay tuned for breakfast. Otherwise, good night. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Yes, there will be some drier, brighter weather around across southern parts tomorrow. But first, there's quite a bit of rain to come, driven by an area of low pressure and an associated frontal system that's sweeping up from the southwest, bringing outbreaks of rain for many. Though initially tonight, there will be some dry weather across parts of Northern Ireland and Northern England, though the outbreaks of rain arriving here. And across eastern parts of Scotland, some persistent rain could actually bring some hills snow over the highest ground. Across the far northwest of Scotland, there may be a touch of frost first thing tomorrow morning. Otherwise, Wednesday gets off to a mild, cloudy and rather damp start for many. Outbreaks of rain, which could turn heavy and persistent across parts of Northern Ireland and southern Scotland through the morning, they will continue across many northern areas into the afternoon, though breaking up a little bit. Across more central and southern parts of England and Wales, turning drier, a few showers, but also some decent bright sunny spells in which it should feel relatively warm with highs around 16 Celsius but markedly colder than this further north. More unsettled weather to come as we go through Thursday. Watch out for some heavy outbreaks of rain sweeping their way from west to east across southern parts of England with further outbreaks of rain further north too and more persistent rain pushing in from the southwest later on and the unsettled theme continues as we head towards the weekend. Could turn very windy in fact by Saturday but temperatures rising likely to get to 20 Celsius. Bye bye. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. For a 
chance to win a prize worth over £20,000? Text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. doing it again. This time, it's the Olympic flag. The Union Jack now almost unrecognisable. Or is it? We'll debate should our flag, should our symbols ever be changed. Pictures have emerged in the last hour of one of the Britons killed in the Israeli airstrike yesterday. On top of that, the Israeli ambassador summoned to the Foreign Office this afternoon. And the National Health Service, well, it's time we actually debated perhaps having a different funding model, because the current one just simply isn't working. But before all those debates, Let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight is that Lord Cameron has told his Israeli counterpart that major changes must be made to ensure the safety of aid workers in Gaza. The Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has described the killing of seven aid workers, including three British nationals, as tragic and unintended. They were delivering vital food supplies, travelling into armoured cars, marked clearly with the logo World Central Kitchen. The aid group claims the attack was carried out despite them coordinating their movements with the Israeli military. The Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, says the work of aid organisations must be protected. They're doing fantastic work bringing uh, alleviation to the suffering that many are experiencing in Gaza. They should be praised uh, and commended for what they're doing. They need to be allowed to do that work unhindered and it's incumbent on Israel to make sure that they can do that and we're asking Israel to investigate what happened urgently because clearly there are questions that need to be answered. Rishi Sunak. Now, comments about Scotland's new hate crime law posted to social media by the author J.K. Rowling are not criminal. That's according to Police Scotland this afternoon. The new law sought to ban hatred against people on certain grounds, but the Harry Potter author said it risked silencing genuine debate on issues around gender, as well as ignoring the rights of women and girls. The Prime Minister backed those concerns, saying that people should not be criminalised for stating simple biology. 
The sports brand Adidas will redesign its German football shirts featuring the number 44 amid concerns over a resemblance to the Nazi SS symbol. The new kits were launched last month ahead of Germany hosting the European Championship. But a historian flagged similarities to the SS logo, which was Nazi Germany's elite military guard under Hitler. The country's 